Good morning. Good to be here. My name is Murray. And so from Grace, Saskatoon, downtown, sort of the originating uh, congregation of Grace Fellowship, and now just excited to have a, a Grace Evergreen in addition to Grace Warman, and as well to be part of Acts 29 Church Planning Network, just that global network that we're a part of. And in the video that you would have seen, uh, we're currently supporting Harrison Kwok at the uh, who's planning Northern Collective Church in Yukon. So, so you, as part of Grace Evergreen too, are helping to support that work. As well as in the past, we've supported Arjuna, who is the pastor from India. And so we've been a part of that as well. So, so it's always good to see uh, faces that I recognize in these videos of people that we've had a part in what they're doing uh, around the globe as well. So I just want to just welcome everyone here, really, because the world in which we live in, it's, it's very hard to measure up. And it's, we never quite fully belong and I think that's why God has purposed this gathering for us. And he invites us really to gather together here as the church of Jesus. We don't just enter through the, through the doors of the school, uh, but really we enter through the finished work of Jesus in whom we're accepted by the God of the universe. That Jesus actually has qualified us to belong is something. So just welcome here, first of all, to all who are exhausted. Jesus invites us into his rest. He has finished the work. To everyone who's just carrying shame and regret, Jesus says, I'm not ashamed to call you my brethren. To all who are fearful and anxious about tomorrow, Jesus says, I'm the Prince of Peace, and he's got a tremendous end of the story for all who come to him, where everything that has gone so wrong will be made right. To all those who feel unloved and rejected, Jesus just says, come unto me. And to all who have sinned and need a Savior, Jesus didn't come to condemn you, but to be condemned for you, that you might be raised to eternal life with him. So Jesus, the friend of sinners, he welcomes us uh, to him. And, and now here as the church, we welcome you as well as Jesus has welcomed us into his life, into his family. You know, having been in, in, in churches for a few years, I'm just, I'm amazed at what people like to talk about. Uh, they want to talk about external things like whether should uh, wear hats or not wear hats, whether deviled eggs should be allowed at a church lunch, um, whether that angers the Lord or not, you know, how loud the music should be, you know, and uh, whether or not a church should meet in a theater, right? Are we promoting movies? Will that lead into dancing? Uh, can Christians dance? Well, I was at the Grace Fellowship New Year's Eve party, and I've learned some can and some can't. Right? And, and hardly a month goes by without somebody wants to engage me in conversation about end times. And by end times, they usually mean all the current events that are going on. You know, is the COVID vaccine the mark of the beast? Um, is there a worldwide conspiracy? You know, will Kirk Cameron get left behind? You know, and it, so it leads to all this conjecture. And we get all these weird conversations on these peripheral topics. But what is the main thing? What is the main thing? And we're told in this passage that we're going to look at as we continue to study through this letter of 1 Corinthians. Here we're told what is of first importance. And you've got to keep the main thing the main thing. Because if you mess this up, everything else is going to be off kilter. So let's uh, pray and let's then have our, our scripture passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So Lord, we're just grateful to you. Thank you that you have sent the Holy Spirit to us to be our teacher and that you can open up our minds and our hearts to be ready to not resist what you speak to us, but actually to receive it with hearts that, that are welcoming a word from you, that we need our thinking corrected. We need... Um, thinking where we've got distortions, where we're believing lies. Lord, we need that corrected by your truth. So would you help us this morning to have greater humility because of what you've done and a greater confidence in you, Jesus, for what you have done and for who you are. So help us this morning as we listen now to your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 23. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So this passage today really gets to the heart of why those of us who believe and follow Jesus do so. In fact, if this is not historical re- reality, then we may as well just use Sunday as a sleep-in day, right? Just throw our Bibles in the, the garbage and just live for today because tomorrow we die and death ends everything for us, which means our only hope is in this life only. But if this good news is historically true, then that changes everything and it's got massive implications for you and for me. So before we go too far into the rest of the passage, I think it'd be good, though, to spend a little time uh, discussing resurrection. Uh, Resurrection, what does that mean? So resurrection, we have to understand, is not simply just life after death, right? There's a lot of confusion about that. But there's a reason that the New Testament has all this emphasis on bodies and empty tombs. So resurrection is about new bodily life in this physical world sometime after death. But in our culture, most people seem to just simply uh, connect resurrection with just life after death. And so there's a lot of confusion then about everything from reincarnation to a whole lot of different um, life after death scenarios. And even in the church, there's just a lot of confusion Where even, I mean, you can sing hymns, talk as if going to heaven is the ultimate end. And many in the the church and outside the church view life after death as simply these disembodied souls uh, going to heaven. But is this what God actually intends for us? Um, Is this what he intends for this, this whole creation just to be done away with like it's been a failed project. You see, many miss the idea of new creation and restoration. But yet, any careful reading of the Bible reveals that this is what God's redemptive story is all about. You see, the assumption is often made that heaven somewhere up there is the ultimate end. Yet, um, well, even in religion, right? That's why then heaven up there... Uh, that's just sort of held out as a carrot, right? To sort of make you shape up, keep you in line. Um, The assumption then that uh, you've got this uh, disembodied spirits living really um, with clouds and angels and harps and cream cheese, right? Um, But that doesn't really just do much for me. Right? That doesn't excite me very much. The whole idea seems very boring. Uh, I mean, think about it. Reclining on white, fluffy clouds. You get wings, and they're not the kind you eat. And you get chubby or chubbier, probably from all that cream cheese, wearing a diaper and playing a harp. So when we speak of eternal life, if you die and wake up on a cloud next to me, wearing a diaper, playing a harp you're in hell, right? I think we can all be in agreement about that, right? I've never played a harp. I only know three 
chords. So, but if that's your unbiblical view of heaven, that's just not very appealing. The, but the Bible doesn't present such a view. It talks about new creation. It talks about this fellowship of love with the triune God himself. And this God is anything but boring. The Bible tells us of the beginning where there's this created paradise talked about in Genesis. But the humans rebel, turn from God's reign to create their own paradise, such as we have in the world today. We'll get my pages connected. And we're told in the scripture that all of us, you, me, each one of us, are born with this sinful iniquity in our hearts, inherited really from our rebel first parents, where we're, we become uppermost in our own affections. We believe we're the center of the universe, and, and everyone and everything around us should serve us, right? It's there to make us happy, do what we want, and that's why we get frustrated like we do. That's why we lose patience like we do, because we operate on this default that it's really all about us. And then we have these expectations that we wish our parents and our spouse and kids and roommates and co-workers would just get. We wish the guy driving so slow in front of us would just comprehend that. And though we try to be our own God, we usurp God's place as rebels, yet he won't leave us alone. And the Bible then unfolds this story of a gracious God seeking and saving a rebellious people who are bent on self-destruction and then redeeming the creation from the curse of sin, seeking lost sinners to the point of God himself becoming a man and then dying the death of damnation that we deserve. So Jesus conquered our great enemy of sin and death without destroying us. And he rose from the dead in a victorious resurrection as what the Bible calls the first fruits of a glorious transformation which culminates in the last book of the Bible where we read this in Revelation 21. The Apostle John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more, no more chaos. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. So this is heaven coming to earth. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them on the redeemed earth. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So this is the world we all want. This is the world we all long for. And we see here this new city coming down from heaven, from God to earth. And verse 5 says, not making all new things, but actually making all things new. So heaven comes down to earth for a restoration. The kingdom of heaven, talked about them by Jesus, the sovereign reign and rule of God, is coming to earth and transforming it where the life of now heaven and earth actually come together. So Jesus has come for transformation, not evacuation. The church then, the citizens of this kingdom of God, represent even now heaven on earth. God's transforming us by his grace to be a people who, in response to this gospel, just turn our backs on self-rule and our own kingdoms of self where we tried to be our own God. And now we've surrendered ourselves to the real God, King Jesus. And we found the joy of being under the reign and rule of this king. It's absolutely the best. And then Romans 8 talks about the whole creation now is groaning and longing for the promise of resurrection. The promise of this renewed earth where the world is then filled with the knowledge and love of God. Again, it's all about transformation, not evacuation. Romans 8 is one of the places where the scripture just gives us this big picture of a cosmos renewed. 
the creation reborn, just as Jesus was in his resurrection. And the central figure of this redeemed world will be Jesus. And when he appears, John tells us, we'll be like him, resurrected with the promise of new glorified bodies in a new creation. And that's why it's such a big deal about, about bodies and empty tombs. Now, but people today often, they just brush off the, the whole idea of resurrection, saying, well, we now have a more enlightened scientific view of history and reality now, and so all this resurrection talk is passé. You know, we don't believe in people bodily rising from the, the dead today. We're more advanced. But I just think, well, do you think Plato or Homer or any other ancient person ever thought that dead people were raised back to life in the ordinary course of events? See, Jesus' disciples, they didn't even believe this was possible. Jesus, uh, Th- Thomas is the most famous doubter, of course, but, but it just never occurred to them that this was a possibility. So all of Jesus' followers, they just expected that when Jesus died, he would do what all people who die do. And you know what that is? Stay dead, right? No one was sitting outside the tomb going, 10, 9, 8, 7. That's not what they were doing, right? But the Christian faith is rooted in the fact that God as creator intends to sort out the world one day and it will be very good if you're his friend. In fact, if you read the New Testament, there really isn't a lot of interest in where the dead are now right? Other than the, the, those who have died in Christ are with him, but all the focus is on resurrection life. It's all the focus is on what happens on that day that's coming when Jesus returns in glory. Now, there's typically three different arguments um, that people use in explaining away the great hope of resurrection. The first one is that they say that Jesus did not really die. But verse 3 in our passage, 1 Corinthians 15, says Christ died. Now, some people attack this truth. Muslims say that Jesus did not die. Some say he faked his death. Um, Maybe he took a drug man, right, gave him these death-like symptoms, sort of Romeo and Juliet-like. But all those arguments just pulled out of the sky just don't match the historical evidence. So I tend to doubt those doubts. You see, Roman soldiers knew how to kill people especially rebel kings. And the trained executioner and the coroner all verified his death. Before Jesus died, think about it, he went through sleeplessness. Of, they had the trials, the beatings that all left him exhausted. Then he was scourged, a punishment that was so horrendous that, that many men died from it before even making it to their crucifixion. And then Jesus was crucified and a professional executioner declared him dead. And then to ensure he was dead, they had this soldier, trained soldier, took a spear, thrust it through his side up into his heart cavity so that it really uh, had this mixture of blood and water pull out because that heart sac was, was burst. That just finished off any possibility of survival. And then Jesus' dead body was wrapped mummy-like Um, with roughly 100 pounds of linens and spices, which if he was able to somehow endure the beatings and the floggings and crucifixion and speared heart, it would have killed him by asphyxiation. And, And even if through all of this, Jesus somehow managed to survive, which in itself would have been a miracle, he he couldn't have endured three days without food and water and medical attention in a sealed cold tomb carved out of a rock. So in summary... I put it this way, Jesus died. He died. For what reason? Well, it says there, for our sins, right? He died as a substitute. He died in our place. I deserve to die the death that he died and to be eternally separated from God. But because he substituted himself for me, I now get to be treated like Jesus deserves. And this is all in accordance with the scriptures, it says. This was all prophesied. It was prophesied and foretold the very way, the very time, uh, the very details. They're all foretold as part of God's plan to redeem a people. And the, the second common argument for explaining away the great hope of resurrection is that the body was stolen. But verse 4 says, he was buried. 
and we know he was buried in a tomb that was sealed by the government. It was guarded by government officials and the Roman army. And these are not just keystone cops, right? This is the supreme elite fighting force of the day. Or another suggestion regarding uh, the reason for the empty tomb was that they went to the wrong tomb. They probably just went to the wrong place. But it was a rich guy's tomb. It was Joseph of Arimathea. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. He was well known. Pretty easy to identify. You know, hey Joseph, where's your tomb again? So that they went to the wrong tomb is just another doubt that I just have complete doubt about. And then we read this, that he was raised on the third day. See, Jesus rose from the dead. That makes him unique. All Christianity hinges on this truth. If Jesus did not physically rise from the dead, then it just doesn't matter what else this book says. But if he did, then it impacts all of us. He is then who he claimed to be. You see, the the fact of the body being stolen, it might actually hold a little weight for me, except for the appearances, the witnesses. Because it wasn't just an empty tomb. But Jesus actually appeared. And all these witnesses that he gives now in the next section of these verses are all pretty credible. Starting in verse 5, he says, And that he appeared to Cephas. Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter. He was a coward who denied Jesus three times. And then he transforms into this bold, courageous man who went on to suffer and die and would not recant. Despite the fact that they crucified him, history says upside down, he was transformed, though, by the resurrection. In John's gospel account, we see as soon as Peter looked into the tomb, he knew Jesus had risen from the dead. And why? Because inside... the grave was this grave encasing mummy like there like an empty cast it wasn't just a sheet and it had this face opening that had had been covered with the cloth but it was now folded to the side so you could actually see in to see that this encasing was now empty and you can't just swipe a body out of a face hole and then it says in verse 5, he continues, and then to the 12. Now there's all the other, referring to all the other disciples who were doubters and skeptics. And they were transformed and convinced by the resurrected Jesus. And Thomas himself, one of the 12, he said, unless I see him, him unless I touch him, I'll never believe. And he ended up worshiping Jesus as God when he saw him. Now, it's a pretty far stretch to have all these cowards, all these doubters, give up everything in their life, suffer, and die for a lie. Because if they lied, what would be the reason? See, people who are liars, you you lie to make your life better for yourself. You lie for power, or you, you lie to avoid something, right? But people don't lie consistently to make life worse for themselves. And then verse 6, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So you've got these crowds now. Here's 500 people at one time. This is a significant public event. And 500 people don't have mass hallucinations. And Paul says, if you don't believe me, just go ask them. Go check it out. Which means this is way too early to be a legend because the witnesses are actually still alive. See, there's people who want to say that the stuff about Jesus claiming to be God and all the miracles, that was all got added in some two or three hundred years later in order for the church to get power. In other words, they say it just all got exaggerated, kind of like the telephone game, right? You know, that game where you whisper a phrase into someone's ear, they whisper it to the next person, and it comes out something very different. But it doesn't fit the evidence, First of all, because we've got copies of the scripture from the first generation. And the witnesses were still alive to actually verify it. In fact, this letter to the Corinthians, which is one of the very earliest letters, was written between 53 and 56 AD. So that was within 20 years of Jesus' death. Now, was anyone here got married about 20 years ago? Yeah, about 20 years ago. Can you prove it? 
oh, you got you, but you also have witnesses. Hopefully, most of them are still alive. Yeah, right. Because we got married over, over forty years ago. I know Dave and Julie got married over forty years ago, and guess what? Many of the people at those weddings, hopefully most of them even, are still around. You can go ask. They heard us make the vows. We have witnesses, credible witnesses, because it's not that long ago, so you can't deny it when it's within that short span of time. Now, I love, too, that he describes those Christians that have died as having fallen asleep. Why? Because people who fall asleep wake up. And he's making sure that we understand that death does not end the story for those of us who are in Jesus, the resurrected king. And then in verse 7, he goes on to talk about his brothers. He mentions James. So James is the one who gets mentioned. And his brothers mocked him. I mean, Jesus' siblings, they didn't believe him. They thought he was out of his mind for claiming to be God, claiming to be the Messiah. And when Jesus died, that should have proved to them that they were right. Because they thought he's crazy claiming to be God, then he dies. See, that should have been the evidence of their claims that he was crazy, that he was not Messiah. He could not possibly be God. So when suddenly you see his own brothers join the Messiah movement and worship Jesus, their brother, as the one true God and Savior, something undeniable must have occurred. Right? And you even have James becomes one of the most prominent leaders in the church of Jerusalem. So what would it take for James to be absolutely convinced and worship his brother as the Lord of the universe? As God in human flesh. Come on, what would it take for you to worship your brother as God? Right? At least an undeniable resurrection. Right? Jesus appeared to him, risen from the dead, and James goes, it's true. And here I thought you were just being a typical obedient firstborn child. Right? But no, James was willing now to be martyred. So convinced of Jesus' resurrection and his own resurrection to come because of it. That's a transformation. And then in verse 8, finally, last of all, Paul saw him too. And Paul was not a friend. He was an enemy. He was a radical opponent of Jesus. He was not somebody predisposed to Christianity. He hated Jesus and Christians because he saw them actually as the biggest problem in the world. His world, for sure, right? And so he got rid of people who worshipped Jesus, right? A little Tony Soprano-like. But he was confronted by the risen Jesus. It was just impossible for him to deny. And so he was transformed to be a man who gave up everything for the service of the kingdom that he once wanted to destroy. Paul says, I wouldn't have had such a change of heart and life. I wouldn't have given up all my power and glory and riches and family, losing everything, but for the undeniable certainty of Jesus and his resurrection. See, he was humbled, beaten, hated, lost everything. Why? Because it was true. That's the only explanation that's reasonable. So, am I going to believe someone who is not an eyewitness and who actually profits making a bunch of money and getting fame by mocking and explaining away the resurrection like scholars who are 2,000 years removed today? over someone who was an eyewitness and willingly gave up everything to be homeless, broken, despised, giving up life itself, standing in the truth that Jesus lived and died and was buried and rose from the dead, and that the risen Jesus was witnessed by many friends and family, enemies and strangers. You see, all the evidence leads me to doubt those doubts that people cast towards the resurrection. And all that points to is good news. That our good creator God was not willing to leave us in our sin. He wasn't willing to leave uh, us as his creatures and his creation in this cursed state of our own doing. In grace and in amazing love, he took the form of a man. He lived the life that we could not live. He died the death we should have died and he beat it. Death is our enemy. 
And that's why we go to the gym and drink bottled water and eat broccoli. But Jesus alone pursued our enemy and conquered it, bursting forth in glorious day, the hymn writer says. The first fruits of a resurrection and a new creation, the world we all want. Or maybe they just stole the body. And we're without hope. Still in our sins, in a sin-filled, sin-cursed world, and death is pursuing, and ultimately we'll face it in our own strength, as all the others who have gone before us have, and lose. So which account are you going to hold on to? God's testimony given through eyewitness accounts of people who are actually there, or the account of skeptics far removed from the scene. So maybe you should doubt your doubts because the evidence for those doubts is actually pretty thin and they sure don't hold up any hope. But Jesus as the sin and death conqueror, think about it. You know, if you had sightings of the risen Jesus without any evidence of an empty tomb, then maybe you could say, oh, maybe it was a spirit, maybe it was a ghost. If you've got the bones, it's pretty easy just to dismiss this as some strange... Uh, experience, of which there's many. Or, if you had the empty tomb, but no sightings. Well, maybe then the body was stolen. But if you put those two things together, empty tomb and appearances, there's not a lot of other alternatives other than that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. So we Christians, we're not believing by blindly jumping over the evidence. Faith in Jesus is not some leap of blind faith. We, like the disciples, are actually driven to believe in the risen Jesus by the evidence which withstands all the evidence of our doubts. The only explanation for all these things, the empty tomb, the sightings, the changed lives, the birth of the church, is resurrection. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. Paul then says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He was a passionate opponent. He was a mocker of Christianity. But something happened that just shattered his worldview. It's a but God. That's what happened. It says in verse 10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that's with me. So Paul says, I've worked hard, but don't pat me on the back. Because any good I've ever done, that was simply the grace and work of God. Verse 11, he says, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. So it's just not about me, Paul says. right? It's about the mission of seeing people come to know and love Jesus. And Paul's not asking God here to use him, right? He's not saying, please use my life, make my life count, Lord. No, he just wants the name and fame of Jesus to go forward. And he says, it doesn't matter whether it's through him or another. He says, I or they. See, Paul no longer sees himself as the name of the game. He's not comparing himself with others because undeserving as he knows he is, he just gets the grace of the gospel. Knowing He's God's son, God's child, not by his work, but by the work of Jesus. And so this is working then from this place of rest that knows God wants me, God loves me, and totally accepts me. So Paul works hard in the mission, but not as an employee, but as a beloved child. And he gets to partner then with God in the things that he is doing and is prepared for him to do. So, how does this all work, though? How do undeserving people get to be loved by God? How do guilty people get forgiven? How do condemned people get mercy? Well, Paul says it's grace. Grace is at the heart of the Christian faith. That's why we call ourselves Grace Fellowship, right? It's, we're sinners who do not merit, deserve, or earn God's love and favor, None of us can claim a right for God to be kind to us, to forgive us, to deliver us, to accept us. It's all, all through the grace of Jesus extended to us. And Paul is saying, I'm fundamentally flawed. 
I'm not worthy to be called even a Christian, let alone an apostle. See, most people, they admit they're not perfect, that they make mistakes, but to actually admit that you're a bad, selfish person wanting to be independent from God and deserving of hell, and your only hope is to be saved by this very God that you've offended, most don't want to go there. Like if you ever hear a politician who gets caught in the act of doing something wrong, how do they talk about it? Well, it was a, it was a mistake. It was an indiscretion, a momentary lapse of judgment. You know what they're trying to say when they say that, right? They say, well, I made a mistake, but deep down, I'm really this, this good, decent, valuable person. But Paul, he says the opposite. 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. In other words, there's nobody as bad as I am. I'm not worthy to be accepted by God. It's, it's grace through Jesus. In fact, in my very best days, I'm desperately in need of God's grace. And that's on my best days. But Jesus didn't die so you could feel guilty about your sin. He actually died so you could be released from that sin and guilt and shame forever and experience the joy of grace and being greatly loved by the God who is love. And Paul says it's grace that's transformed him. And only by grace has he ever accomplished anything of value. It's given him this humble confidence in contrast to the religious system he was under before, which gave him pride and left others in despair. So my desire, though, is that you would not just believe the facts of the gospel, but that you would receive the truth that these facts point to, which is the person of Jesus. And then take your stand on his finished work, his death for our sins, and his resurrection and victory for those who believe that you might be saved, and that your resurrection then would be unto life with Jesus, increasing in joy forever in the new heavens and new earth, and this is going to be better than anything you could ever imagine. I want to just close with reading 1 Corinthians 15, the last verses. And I know we're not there yet, and you're going to get there in a few weeks eventually, but I can't wait, and I won't be here. So I want to get there right now. Let's pick up the last verses, starting in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Here's when it all takes place, at that last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So it doesn't sound like when you get raised up, you're going to be zombies. There's going to be transformation. Verse 54, he continues, When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass. It's that day, right? At the last trump, at the return of Jesus, in our resurrection, that the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory at the last trump when Jesus returns. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In modern English, that's na 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 na. You got it, at least some of you. But death is this spear aimed right at your heart, and Jesus has thrown himself in front of it. Death is not natural, nor is death my friend. Nothing pulls the rug out from life like death, but death has been defanged. Death used to be an executioner. Now the gospel has made him just a gardener. All he can do is plant the seed. Paul's going to use that metaphor coming up. And because of Jesus, all who put their trust in him will be raised up in a glorious resurrection when Jesus returns and says, dry bones live. And I'm going to bawl like a newborn baby with joy unspeakable. And my Savior and first love will embrace me in his arms, wipe away every tear, 
and tell me, see, it's all just like I said. Come on, I have someone I want you to meet. And it's not going to be, a, I won't be a, this random raindrop going back to the ocean. What hope or joy is there in that? Nor will I be a disembodied spirit. But the day is coming when Jesus will take my hand and say, Murray, it's time to wake up. And I will rise bodily in newness of life with the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Lord, when I look at the history when I look at the facts, when I look at the evidence, clearly something happened that made cowardly people brave, something that made skeptical people believe, something that transformed haters of Jesus, transformed them into his worshipers, something that gave guilty people hope, something that made mothers and children bravely face death in the lion's den together with joy, something actually happened. And because of you, Jesus, My funeral will not be the last word. You are the final word. And you will raise up all. And those who believe and receive you will be raised to life, life with you in the kingdom that knows no end. Just open hearts, Lord, to this truth that everyone here might bow and believe in you, Jesus, the resurrection and the life. And don't let us just accept these truths in an academic, detached way and help those still struggling with many questions just to keep seeking and searching. And Lord, would you lead them to you, the answer to their soul's great need. For everything we really need is found in you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.